502, Chapters 2 and 3 of Treasure Island. Book Talk starts at 750. Welcome to Craplet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 502, De Bilbo. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you, and me feeling slightly less guilty this week. <laughs> Well, hello. How are you? I am well. It is not before the crack of dawn this morning, so I'm feeling pretty good, actually. I slept, I think, seven hours. Woo! I know. There have been a lot of early mornings in my life lately. And by early, I mean 4 a.m. on the road by 5 a.m. So, yeah, there's that. But on the upside, I'm back at the microphone. Yay! I have two chapters for you today, chapter two and chapter three. They're excellent. They are, you know, moving the story along. But we learned some, I think, pretty interesting things uh, just in general today. So that's always fun. On the crafty side of things, I am still working on Procreate on the iPad. And I have two YouTubers who I think you might be interested in if you are at all into painting, sketching, drawing, anything like that, or if you have children who are. The first one works in acrylics only. His name is Mural Joe, and I've put a link to his YouTube channel in the show notes. I find this guy fascinating because he's completely unorthodox. He's not always great with his explanations with words, but if you just watch what he's doing with his brushes and his paint, you'll learn a lot. He has some really, really interesting examples of his work, too, that he, he shows you. One where he's doing a, a Trump Loyal pirate ship and island, which is so appropriate, right? He did it for a mural for a children's hospital room, a waiting room in Flagstaff, Arizona. And it's really cool. And he goes through in this course of, I don't know, four or five different videos, explaining how he did certain parts of it which is actually a lot of fun. But he's really good at doing oceans and explaining or at least demonstrating how to get that particular look for the ocean. And he talks a lot about light and what it does with water and demonstrates quite accurately that you don't have to just paint blue in order to make an ocean look realistic. He does one where the watercolor is red. And that's quite something, I thought. The other person is iPad specific and uh, and Procreate specific. Her channel name is Bardo Brush, B A R D O T. Bardo Brush, she has tons of Procreate brushes that she has available, some for sale, some are free. But she does a really neat job of demystifying shape. And she's very clear that there's no reason why you have to use. Procreate to do any of the things that she's showing you how to do. You can use pencil, you can use paper, you can use paints, whatever. But she does some things with like how to draw a bear. And she breaks down how to look at the bear shape wise in order to be able to eventually, after tracing, copying several different kinds of bear from pictures, she gets you to a point where you understand the structure of a bear well enough that you could just draw one on your own. And she's very clear that part of what she's doing is walking you through the process that you would need to go through in order to develop your own style. And I was reading some of the YouTube comments. Everybody is so excited and so thankful and so grateful to her and saying such lovely things. And then all of a sudden at the bottom, you know it's coming. There's one snarky person who goes, I guess I understand what you're trying to do, but this isn't really anything about developing a style. And she wrote back and said, well, no, actually it is that you have to understand what it is that you're doing in order to get to the point where you have your own style. You practice a lot. And she keeps talking about that during the video. 
It takes a lot of practice, but it's mindful practice. It's the same thing as in cognitive anchoring, that the, the mindful practice gets you to the point where you can go on autopilot. And once you can go on autopilot, you kind of transcended that beginner level, and now you are able to roll without the training wheels. And that's the direction you have to go in in order to develop your own style. So I, I just really like her attitude. She's very positive. She's very upbeat. She does a great job with tutorials. And I thought, man, if I had had access to someone like her when I was a kid, or if I had been able to give my kids access to her when they were kids, I don't know about them, but for me, it sure would have helped. I think it would have been a really good opportunity to demystify art so that it isn't something that only masters do, something that only people who get their stuff exhibited in museums can do. Ooh, and on that, I also found a New York Times did a, a video on Bob Ross, which, I mean, he's both revered and a joke, which is kind of cool because how many people get to be both at the same time? It's pretty impressive. But one of the things that was a question, evidently, was, gosh, where are all the Bob Ross paintings? Because nobody seems to own one anywhere at all. And this one New York Times reporter had wanted to buy a Bob Ross painting for his brother. And so these reporters went on the hunt for Bob Ross paintings. And it turns out there is Bob Ross, Inc. in Herndon, Virginia. And they have all of the Bob Ross paintings in boxes. And uh, they're not interested in selling them. That's not what it's about. So instead, eventually and finally, the Smithsonian took several of the 10,000. But, but saying 10,000 is misleading. There were 10,000 images that he painted but he did three versions of each one. He did the pre-show version, just, just to test the, that particular version for its, its strengths and weaknesses. Then he did the on-air version, which is the one that you see in the show. And then he did a post-show version. And that was what he painted after he'd learned everything from the first two. That means that there's 30,000 Bob Ross paintings out there in boxes in Herndon, Virginia. It's a special kind of brain that thinks in a process like that. And I thought that was just so impressive. I'll try and find that video again and link to it for you in the show notes. Okay, chapters two and three of Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Last week, we met young Jim Hawkins and the captain, and really just sort of saw a little bit of Dr. Livesey. We know that Jim and his mother and father run an inn in a quiet cove on the southwestern edge of England, and we know that Jim's father is sick. This week, you will get to hear Bless His Heart used in a <laughs> non-Southern context, non-Southern American, not South American, Southern American context, which, if you don't remember, we've talked about this a long time ago. Oh, bless her heart. If you're in the South and you hear that said, the person whose heart is in question is not really so much being blessed as being snarked at. You're going to hear it used pretty much identically in the book today. And it, it made me giggle out loud when I heard it. So that was fun. You may wonder why this episode is called De Bilbo, and that is because in Henry V, there is a scene where Catherine, French, is learning how to say words in English. This scene always cracked me up, and for some reason, the part that cracked me up the most was her mispronunciation of elbow, and it is De Bilbo. I have copied and pasted some of the particular scene. I think it's act three, scene four from Henry V. I copied and pasted it into the show notes for you so you can see all of the, the French and the goofy pronunciations of her learning English. I just thought it was a charming scene. And for some reason, that had stuck with me. And part of it sticking with me is that every time I have heard the Admiral Benbow mentioned as, as an adult, I have thought the Admiral Bilbo, not Bilbo Baggins, to Bilbo. So that's the whole reason behind the name of the chapter. 
It's sad and goofy, but there it is. You are going to hear a reference to bloodletting, not using leeches, but using a, a little lancet. This was still being done when Robert Louis Stevenson was writing in 1881. However, it wasn't being done nearly as much as it had been done in the early 1700s. As we know from previous books, including Jekyll and Hyde, the center of medical learning was in Edinburgh, which is where Robert Louis Stevenson was raised. So he would have known as he was growing up that bloodletting was going out of style. And in fact, several Scottish physicians were instrumental in using science to prove that bloodletting was not so much science as it was just habit. There are, of course, rather famous examples now of doctors using leeches to reattach limbs and fingers because by their sucking action, oh God, it's so disgusting, the leeches begin getting the blood to flow between the limb or the digit, the part of your body that had been unfortunately removed <laughs> and, and getting the blood flowing through it as you work to reattach it. Those are medically bred leeches, and it just gives me the heebie-jeebies. But regular bloodletting, where they, you know, put a basin out in front of you and punctured a vein and just let your blood go, that wasn't really being done anymore when Robert Louis Stevenson was writing. So this is, this is definitely him going, hearkening back to a time that was a long time ago for him, too. Calling somebody a swab would be pejorative. That is, uh, somebody whose job is to swab the deck and not much else is somebody whose job it is to mop up after everybody else. So calling you a swab was supposed to be derogatory. Yellow Jack is yellow fever. I have put a link to the Yellow Fever Map Index from the CDC in the show notes because holy cow, yellow fever is really horrible and horrifying. It's not malaria. It's it's wow. Let's just say you don't want to get yellow fever. It is a mosquito-borne illness. It is horrifying and it's still out there a lot. So, ew. And the, the other ew, you're going to hear a character described as tallow-y, like tallow-colored. I've included a picture on the show notes of a set of tallow candles so you can see what that color is. Um, it's yellowy. It's kind of what you would expect, kind of the waxy, yellowy, not a very healthy look for somebody. But I also linked from that picture to a website on how to make tallow candles and specifically how to make tallow candles that are uh, emergency candles in mason jars. She links out from that site to a very thorough description of how to render beef fat or pork fat for tallow. And she claims that tallow candles don't smell. <clears throat> I've been around tallow candles a couple of times and they did. So she's either way better at making them, which is totally possible, or she's just not smelling it anymore. <laughs> and I'm not sure which, <laughs> but it's not a bad skill set to have. Now, one thing, as you were listening once we hit chapter three, when you start to hear our captain, he punctuates what's the, going to be the beginning of a stretch of, of narrative coming out of his mouth. When it starts with thunder, he cried, a week? From that point on, for the next few minutes, you might want to bookmark that spot so that you can come back later in the book and re-listen to his descriptions. It's just something to keep track of and take a second look at a little bit later when we're further into the book. All right? You know, just foreshadowingness and all that. <laughs> all right. So let's listen to chapters two and three, and I'll catch you on the flip side with some follow ups. Here we go. It was not very long after this that there occurred the first of the mysterious events that rid us at last of the captain, though not, as you will see, of his affairs. 
It was a bitter cold winter, with long hard frosts and heavy gales, and it was plain from the first that my poor father was little likely to see the spring. He sank daily, and my mother and I had all the inn upon our hands, and were kept busy enough without paying much regard to our unpleasant guest. It was one January morning, very early, a pinching, frosty morning, the cove all grey with hoar-frost, the ripple lapping softly on the stones, the sun still low and only touching the hilltops, and shining far to seaward. The captain had risen earlier than usual, and set out down the beach, his cutlass swinging under the broad skirts of the old blue coat, his brass telescope under his arm, his hat tilted back upon his head. I remember his breath hanging like smoke in his wake as he strode off, and the last sound I heard of him, as he turned the big rock, was a loud snort of indignation, as though his mind was still running upon Dr. Livesey. Well, mother was upstairs with father, and I was laying the breakfast-table against the captain's return, when the parlour door opened, and a man stepped in on whom I had never set my eyes before. He was a pale, tallowy creature, wanting two fingers of the left hand, and though he wore a cutlass, he did not look much like a fighter. I had always my eyes open for seafaring men, with one leg or two, and I remember this one puzzled me. He was not sailory, and yet he had a smack of the sea about him, too. I asked him what was for his service, and he said he would take rum but as I was going out of the room to fetch it, he sat down upon a table and motioned to me to draw near. I paused where I was with my napkin in my hand. "'Come here, Sonny,' said he. "'Come nearer here.' I took a step nearer. "'Is this here table for my mate, Bill?' he asked with a kind of leer. I told him I did not know his mate Bill, and this was for a person who stayed at our house, whom we called the captain. "'Well,' said he, "'my mate Bill would be called the captain, like as not. He has a cut on one cheek, and a mighty pleasant way with him, particularly in drink, as my mate Bill. We'll put it, for argument like, that your captain has a cut on one cheek.' and we'll put it, if you like, that that cheek's the right one. Ah, well, I told you. Now is my mate Bill in this here house? I told him he was out walking. Which way, Sonny, which way is he gone? And when I pointed out the rock, and told him how the captain was likely to return, and how soon, and answered a few other questions, Ah, oh, said he, "'This'll be as good as drink to my mate Bill.' The expression of his face as he said these words was not at all pleasant, and I had my own reasons for thinking that the stranger was mistaken, even supposing he meant what he said. But it was no affair of mine, I thought, and besides it was difficult to know what to do. The stranger kept hanging about just inside the inn door, peering round the corner like a cat waiting for a mouse. Once I stepped out myself into the road, but he immediately called me back, and, as I did not obey quick enough for his fancy, a most horrible change came over his tallowy face, and he ordered me in with an oath that made me jump. As soon as I was back again he returned to his former manner, half fawning, half sneering, patted me on the shoulder, and told me I was a good boy, and he had taken quite a fancy to me. "'I have a son of my own,' said he, "'as like to you as two blocks, and he's all the pride of my art. But the great thing for boys is discipline, sonny. Discipline. Now, if you had sailed along of Bill, you wouldn't have stood there to be spoke to twice, not you.' That was never Bill's way, nor the way of sich as sailed with him. And here, sure enough, is my mate Bill, with a spy-glass under his arm. Bless his old heart, to be sure. 
You and me just go back into the parlour, Sonny, and get behind the door, and we'll give Bill a little surprise. Bless his heart, I say again. So saying, the stranger backed along with me into the parlour, and put me behind him into the corner, so that we were both hidden by the open door. I was very uneasy and alarmed, as you may fancy, but it rather added to my fears to observe that the stranger was certainly frightened himself. He cleared the hilt of his cutlass, and loosened the blade in the sheath, and all the time we were waiting there he kept swallowing, as if he felt what we used to call a lump in the throat. At last in strode the captain, slammed the door behind him without looking to the right or left, and marched straight across the room to where his breakfast waited him. "'Bill!' said the stranger, in a voice that I thought he had tried to make bold and big. The captain spun round on his heel and fronted us. All the brown had gone out of his face, and even his nose was blue, and he had the look of a man who sees a ghost, or the evil one, or something worse, if anything can be and upon my word I felt sorry to see him all in a moment turn so old and sick. "'Come, Bill, you know me. You know an old shipmate, Bill, surely,' said the stranger. The captain made a sort of gasp. "'Black dog,' said he. "'And who else?' returned the other, getting more at his ease. "'Black dog as ever was. Come for to see his old shipmate, Billy, at the Admiral Benbow Inn. Oh, Bill, Bill, we have seen a sight of times, us two, since I lost them two talons, holding up his mutilated hand. Now look here, said the captain. You've run me down. Here I am. Well, then, speak up. What is it? That's you, Bill, returned Black Dog. You're in the right of it, Billy. I'll have a glass of rum from this dear child here, as I've took such a liking to, and we'll sit down, if you please, and talk square, like old shipmates. When I returned with the rum, they were already seated on either side of the captain's breakfast-table, Black Dog next to the door, and sitting sideways so as to have one eye on his shipmate, and one, as I thought, on his retreat. He bade me go and leave the door wide open. "'None of your keyholes for me, Sonny,' he said, and I left them together and retired into the bar. For a long time, though, I certainly did my best to listen. I could hear nothing but low gabbling, and at last the voices began to grow higher, and I could pick up a word or two, mostly oaths, from the captain. "'No, no, 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 and an end of it!' he cried once, and again, "'If it comes to swinging, swing all, say I!' Then all of a sudden there was a tremendous explosion of oaths and other noises. The chair and table went over in a lump. A clash of steel followed, and then a cry of pain, and the next instant I saw Black Dog in full flight, and the captain hotly pursuing, both with drawn cutlasses, and the former streaming blood from the left shoulder. Just at the door the captain aimed at the fugitive one last tremendous cut, which would certainly have split him to the chin had it not been intercepted by our big signboard of Admiral Benbow. You may see the notch on the lower side of the frame to this day. That blow was the last of the battle. Once out upon the road, Black Dog, in spite of his wound, showed a wonderful clean pair of heels, and disappeared over the edge of the hill in half a minute. The captain, for his part, stood staring at the signboard like a bewildered man. Then he passed his hand over his eyes several times, and at last turned back into the house. "'Jim,' says he, "'rum!' And as he spoke he reeled a little, and caught himself with one hand against the wall. "'Are you hurt?' cried I. "'Rum!' he repeated. "'I must get away from here. Rum! Rum!' I ran to fetch it, but I was quite unsteadied by all that had fallen out, and I broke one glass and fouled the tap, and while I was still getting in my own way I heard a loud fall in the parlour, and running in beheld the captain lying full length upon the floor. At the same instant my mother, alarmed by the cries and fighting, 
came running downstairs to help me. Between us we raised his head. He was breathing very loud and hard, but his eyes were closed, and his face was a horrible colour. "'Dear, deary me!' cried my mother. "'What a disgrace upon the house! And your poor father sick!' In the meantime we had no idea what to do to help the captain, nor any other thought but that he had got his death hurt in the scuffle with the stranger. I got the rum, to be sure, and tried to put it down his throat, but his teeth were tightly shut, and his jaws as strong as iron. It was a happy relief to us when the door opened, and Dr. Livesey came in on his visit to my father. "'Oh, doctor!' we cried. "'What shall we do? Where is he wounded?' "'Wounded? A fiddlestick's end,' said the doctor. "'No more wounded than your eye. The man has had a stroke, as I warned him. Now, Mrs. Hawkins, just you run upstairs to your husband and tell him, if possible, nothing about it. For my part, I must do my best to save this fellow's trebly worthless life. And, Jim, you get me a basin.' When I got back with the basin, the doctor had already ripped up the captain's sleeve and exposed his great sinewy arm. It was tattooed in several places. Here's luck, a fair wind, and Billy Bones, his fancy, were very neatly and clearly executed on the forearm, and up near the shoulder there was a sketch of a gallows and a man hanging from it, done, as I thought, with great spirit. Prophetic! said the doctor, touching this picture with his finger. "'And now, Master Billy Bones, if that be your name, we'll have a look at the colour of your blood. Jim,' he said, "'are you afraid of blood?' "'No, sir,' said I. "'Well, then,' said he, "'you hold the basin.' And with that he took his lancet and opened a vein. A great deal of blood was taken before the captain opened his eyes and looked mistily about him. First he recognised the doctor with an unmistakable frown, then his glance fell upon me, and he looked relieved. But suddenly his colour changed, and he tried to raise himself, crying, "'Where's Black Dog?' "'There's no Black Dog here,' said the doctor, "'except what you have on your own back. You have been drinking rum. You have had a stroke, precisely as I told you, and I have just very much against my own will dragged you head foremost out of the grave. Now, Mr. Bones—' "'That's not my name,' he interrupted. "'Much I care,' returned the doctor. "'It's the name of a buccaneer of my acquaintance, and I'll call you by it for the sake of shortness. But what I have to say to you is this. One glass of rum won't kill you. But if you take one, you'll take another and another. And I'll stake my wig if you don't break off short, you'll die.' Do you understand that? Die, and go to your own place, like the man in the Bible. Come now, make an effort. I'll help you to your bed for once. Between us, with much trouble, we managed to hoist him upstairs, and laid him on his bed, where his head fell back on the pillow as if he was almost fainting. Now, mind you, said the doctor, I clear my conscience. The name of rum for you is death and with that he went off to see my father, taking me with him by the arm. "'This is nothing,' he said, as soon as he had closed the door. "'I have drawn blood enough to keep him quiet a while. He should lie for a week where he is. That is the best thing for him and you. But another stroke would settle him.'" End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 the black spot. About noon I stopped at the captain's door with some cooling drinks and medicines. He was lying very much as we had left him, only a little higher, and he seemed both weak and excited. "'Jim,' he said, "'you're the only one here that's worth anything, and you know I've always been good to you. Never a month but I've given you a silver fourpenny for yourself. And now, you see, mate, I'm pretty low and deserted by all. And, Jim, you'll bring me one noggin of rum now, won't you, matey?" "'The doctor,' I began. But he broke in, cursing the doctor in a feeble voice, but heartily. 
doctors is all swabs, he said. And that doctor there, why, what does he know about seafaring men? I've been in places hot as pitch, and mates dropping round with yellow jack, and the blessed land a heaving like the sea with earthquakes. What do the doctor know of lands like that? And I've lived on rum, I can tell you. It's been meat and drink, a man and wife to me, and if I'm not to have my rum now, I'm a poor old hulk on a lee shore. My blood'll be on you, Jim, and that doctor swab. And he ran on again for a while with curses. Look, Jim, how my fingers fidges, he continued in the pleading tone. I can't keep em still, not I. I haven't had a drop this blessed day. That doctor's a fool, I tell you. If I don't have a drain of rum, Jim, I'll have the horrors. I seen some on em already. I seen old Flint in the corner there behind you. Plain as print I seen him. And if I get the horrors, I'm a man that has lived rough, and I'll raise Cain. Your doctor hisself said one glass wouldn't hurt me. I'll give you a golden guinea for a noggin, Jim. He was growing more and more excited, and this alarmed me, for my father, who was very low that day, needed quiet. Besides, I was reassured by the doctor's words, now quoted to me, and rather offended by the offer of a bribe. "'I want none of your money,' said I. "'But what you owe my father. I'll get you one glass and no more.' When I brought it to him, he seized it greedily and drank it out. "'Aye, aye,' said he. "'That's some better, sure enough. And now, matey, did that doctor say how long I was to lie here in this old berth?' "'A week at least,' said I. "'Thunder!' he cried. "'A week! I can't do that. They'd have the black spot on me by then. The lubbers is going to get the wind of me this blessed moment. Lubbers as couldn't keep what they got, and want to nail what is another's. Is that seemingly behaviour now, I want to know? But I'm a saving soul. I never wasted good money of mine, nor lost it neither. And I'll trick em again. I'm not afraid on them.' I'll shake out another reef, matey, and dandle em again." As he was thus speaking, he had risen from bed with great difficulty, holding to my shoulder with a grip that almost made me cry out, and moving his legs like so much dead weight. His words, spirited as they were in meaning, contrasted sadly with the weakness of the voice in which they were uttered. He paused when he had got into a sitting position on the edge. "'That doctor's done me!' he murmured. "'My ears is singing. Lay me back!' Before I could do much to help him, he had fallen back again to his former place, where he lay for a while silent. "'Jim,' he said at length, "'you saw that seafaring man to-day?' "'Black Dog?' I asked. "'Ah, Black Dog,' said he. "'He's a bad un. But there's worse that put him on. Now, if I can't get away no how, and they tip me the black spot, mind you, it's my old sea-chest thereafter. You get on a horse. You can, can't you? Well, then, you get on a horse and go to—well, yes, I will—to that eternal doctor swab, and tell him to pipe all hands, magistrates and sitch, and he'll lay em aboard at the Admiral Bembo. All old Flint's crew, man and boy, all on em that's left. I was first mate, I was, old Flint's first mate, and I'm the only one as knows the place. He gave it me to Savannah, when he lay a-dying, like as if I was to now, you see. But you won't peach unless they got the black spot on me, or unless you see that black dog again or a seafaring man with one leg, Jim, him above all. "'But what is the black spot, Captain?' I asked. "'That's a summons, mate. I'll tell you if they get that. But you'll keep your weather eye open, Jim, and I'll share with you equals upon my honour. He wandered a little longer, his voice growing weaker, but soon after I had given him his medicine, which he took like a child with the remark, 
"'If ever a seaman wanted drugs, it's me!' He fell at last into a heavy, swoon-like sleep in which I left him. What I should have done had all gone well, I do not know. Probably I should have told the whole story to the doctor, for I was in mortal fear lest the captain should repent of his confessions and make an end of me. But as things fell out, my poor father died quite suddenly that evening, which put all other matters on one side. Our natural distress, the visits of the neighbours, the arranging of the funeral, and all the work of the inn to be carried on in the meanwhile, kept me so busy that I had scarcely time to think of the captain, far less to be afraid of him. He got downstairs next morning, to be sure, and had his meals as usual, though he ate little, and had more, I am afraid, than his usual supply of rum, for he helped himself out of the bar, scowling and blowing through his nose, and no one dared to cross him. On the night before the funeral he was as drunk as ever, and it was shocking in that house of mourning to hear him singing away his ugly old sea-song, but weak as he was we were all in fear of death for him, and the doctor was suddenly taken up with a case many miles away, and was never near the house after my father's death. I have said the captain was weak, and indeed he seemed rather to grow weaker than to regain his strength. He clambered up and down stairs, and went from the parlour to the bar and back again, and sometimes put his nose out of door to smell the sea, holding on to the walls as he went for support, and breathing hard and fast, like a man on a steep mountain. He never particularly addressed me, and it is my belief that he had as good as forgotten his confidences, but his temper was more flighty, and, allowing for his bodily weaknesses, more violent than ever. He had an alarming way now, when he was drunk, of drawing his cutlass, and laying it bare before him on the table. But with all that he minded people less, and seemed shut up in his own thoughts, and rather wandering. Once, for instance, to our extreme wonder, he piped up to a very different air, a kind of country love-song that he must have learned in his youth, before he had begun to follow the sea. So things passed, until the day after the funeral, and about three o'clock of a bitter, foggy, frosty afternoon, I was standing at the door for a moment, full of sad thoughts about my father, when I saw someone drawing slowly near along the road. He was plainly blind, for he tapped before him with a stick, and wore a great green shade over his eyes and nose, and he was hunched as if with age or weakness, and wore a huge old tattered sea-cloak with a hood that made him appear positively deformed. I never saw in my life a more dreadful-looking figure. He stopped a little from the inn, and, raising his voice in an old sing-song, addressed the air in front of him. "'Will any kind friend inform a poor blind man, who has lost the precious sight of his eyes in the gracious defence of his native country England, and God bless King George, where, or in what part of this country, he may now be?' "'You are at the Admiral Benbow, Black Hill Cove, my good man,' said I. "'I hear a voice,' said he, "'a young voice. Will you give me your hand?' my kind young friend, and lead me in." I held out my hand, and the horrible, soft-spoken, eyeless creature gripped it in a moment like a vice. I was so much startled that I struggled to withdraw, but the blind man pulled me close to him with a single action of his arm. "'Now, boy,' he said, "'take me in to the captain.' "'Sir,' said I, Upon my word, I dare not. Oh, he sneered, that's it. Take me in, straight, or I'll break your arm. He gave it, as he spoke, a wrench that made me cry out. Sir, said I, it is for yourself, I mean. The captain is not what he used to be. He sits with a drawn cutlass. Another gentleman. Come now, march, interrupted he and I never heard a voice so cruel and cold and ugly as that blind man's. It cowed me more than the pain, and I began to obey him at once, walking straight in at the door and towards the parlour, where the sick old buccaneer was sitting, 
dazed with rum. The blind man clung close to me, holding me in one iron fist, and leaning almost more of his weight on me than I could carry. "'Lead me straight up to him, and when I'm in view cry out, "'Here's a friend for you, Bill. If you don't, I'll do this.' And with that he gave me a twitch that I thought would have made me faint. Between this and that I was so utterly terrified by the blind beggar that I forgot my terror of the captain, and as I opened the parlour door cried out the words he had ordered in a trembling voice. The poor captain raised his eyes, and at one look the rum went out of him and left him staring sober. The expression of his face was not so much of terror as of mortal sickness. He made a movement to rise, but I do not believe he had enough force left in his body. "'Now, Bill, sit where you are,' said the beggar. "'If I can't see, I can hear a finger stirring. Business is business. Hold out your left hand. Boy, take his left hand by the wrist, and bring it near to my right.' We both obeyed him to the letter, and I saw him pass something from the hollow of the hand that held his stick into the palm of the captain's, which closed upon it instantly. "'And now that's done,' said the blind man, and at the words he suddenly left hold of me, and, with incredible accuracy and nimbleness, skipped out of the parlour and into the road, where, as I stood motionless, I could hear his stick go tap-tap-tapping into the distance. It was some time before either I or the captain seemed to gather our senses, but at length, and about the same moment, I released his wrist, which I was still holding, and he drew in his hand and looked sharply into the palm. Ten o'clock!' he cried. Six hours! We'll do em yet!' And he sprang to his feet. Even as he did so he reeled, put his hand to his throat, stood swaying for a moment, and then, with a peculiar sound, fell from his whole height, face foremost to the floor. I ran to him at once, calling to my mother, but haste was all in vain. The captain had been struck dead by thundering apoplexy. It is a curious thing to understand, for I had certainly never liked the man, though of late I had begun to pity him but soon as I saw that he was dead, I burst into a flood of tears. It was the second death I had known, and the sorrow of the first was still fresh in my heart. End of chapter 3— Alrighty then, lots of sadness and death. That is only the third chapter of the book, so starting on a downer. Interesting that we really haven't seen Jim's father in action much prior to his death. And we've only sort of seen his mom so far. Is this kind of the, the classic young adult get the parents out of the way trope? Uh, probably a little bit. Like so many things, Robert Louis Stevenson, it's not entirely the first time that that's happened in novels, but it's sure close. Robert Louis Stevenson is responsible, as we talked about before, for pretty much our modern conception of what a pirate is and how they sounded and what they did and all of that. The other thing that he's responsible for is the black spot. I went and I, I did some research on this. This is the first time that anybody, at least in, in writing, had conceived of this idea of the black spot as a summons or a, a death warrant a time time by which you either better have what you needed to have, all your ducks in a row and whatnot, and either be prepared that way or be prepared to die. However, since that time, the black spot has been referenced in everything, including P.G. Woodhouse. So, <laughs> Stevenson is everywhere. Okay, going back to the beginning of chapter two, there was a, a statement, and I didn't want to spoil it for you by giving too much away. The statement is that uh, when the guys were having the fight with the cutlass and, and all of that, that he almost gave Black Dog a whack that would have split him to the chine. C-H-I-N-E. That's his backbone. So, ooh, number one. Number two, I love the little touch 
that Stevenson put in of saying that he he would have cut him to the chine if it hadn't been for his cutlass catching the sign over the Admiral Benbow Inn. If you look at the image that we're using for the thumbnail for these episodes, these early book episodes, you will see the sign of the Admiral Benbow prominently displayed at the top. It's a hefty piece of wood in the illustration, and it is certainly the exact same thing that I had envisioned in my own mind. But I love that Stevenson says, and the nick is still there, you could go and see it. Because he just adds enough of that kind of flavor to the story to, especially for a kid, to make it real. Well, you wouldn't have written that if you couldn't really go find the Admiral Benbow, would he? I mean, he says you can still see the the cut in the wood. That's so awesome. I just, I love stuff like that. I thought Dr. Livesey's description of the captain as an alcoholic was uh, remarkably good for the time in which this was written. And I thought the captain's description of hitting some delirium tremens of his own was also not far off. Just good, not only good writing, but again, growing up in Edinburgh, the level of education around medicine is, it just would have been more accurate. You would have picked this stuff up. And certainly uh, Stevenson's family was well enough to do that he would have had access to highly educated people uh, as a child as well. So not a huge surprise. And we know he was at least interested in this somewhat because of all the work he did on Jekyll and Hyde as well, uh, and all of the connections between medicine and science that were going back and forth in that book. On the subject of death, Jim's father's death and the captain's death, this coincided strangely, uh, reading these chapters, coincided strangely for me with seeing an Adam Ruins Everything episode. I don't know if you've been watching Adam Ruins Everything since he was uh, just a YouTuber, just a wee YouTuber. But Adam Conover has become quite an interesting public service. And his show has moved over to Netflix. So, of course, he has a much bigger staff and budget and all of that. And more on Adam in a second. But one of the more recent episodes is Adam Ruins Death. I'm not joking when I say public service. If you've listened for a long time, you may refa- recall when my grandfather passed away. And I believe I spoke at the time about the importance of living wills, not even so much as a way to indicate whether you wanted to be kept on life support indefinitely or not, but but also as just a way to communicate to your family that these are your wishes. These are the things that you want done to you after you're gone, if only because it will make everything so much easier on those who are left behind by you. Uh, They won't have to guess or worry about doing something wrong if you can do them the courtesy of letting them know. Adam talks about that somewhat, but he, he also talks about the, the death industry and options to very expensive funerals and what embalming actually is and whether it's important or useful or not. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that he deals with on that. And he does a, an impressive, impressive job. But the other thing that he does that I think is really important on his show and something that is definitely worth showing children is that he corrects his errors. He routinely has episodes where he goes back in and says, okay, we got this one wrong and we got it wrong for these reasons. This was the data that we were looking at. This was the information that we were looking at at the time. Here's what's come out since then. Or here's the information we should have been looking at that we just didn't know about because we didn't come across it in our research. And if you look at this information up against the information that we used, you can see that this is where we made our mistake and our conclusions. And it is fantastic to be able to show, especially kids, but also for grownups, to be able to show a grownup saying, ooh, look, look where I made a mistake, a legitimate, honest error. And here's what I've learned since that has made me change my mind or change my conclusions because, ooh, that's what grownups do. And that's what learning is all about. And, and I just have so much respect for that. I think he's, he is a national treasure doing an important service for all of us. So that's, that was kind of cool. But Adam Ruins Death, I'm putting the link in the show notes. So worth watching. And that is it for me. I hope you enjoyed our chapters today. I hope you are looking forward to the rest of the book. It's a good summer beach read, right? Because beach and 
<laughs> pirates and ocean and treasure. And, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. All right. Have a great one. I will talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review at iTunes or like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter or any one of a million different places that Craftlet wound up over the last 13 years. For more information on Craftlet, you can visit craftlit.com and subscribe via your favorite podcast app or download the Craftlet app so you can get all of your episodes right there in your hand, all in one place without having to hassle with anything else. So you can be sure not to miss any of Treasure Island. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Thanks. Thanks.